Hello and welcome back for another presentation in weather and climate, this time discussing weather forecasting. You know, weather forecasting is actually quite important, especially when discussing climate change, because weather forecasting uses that data. You know, when we think of forecasting, we think of like the three day, the five day, the seven day forecast to try to plan you know, our vacations or trips and things that we're going to be doing, you know, in the future. But the way that those are even, you know, produced by looking you know, on your phone when you type in weather and stuff like that is much more complicated using lots of different data sets and predictions that allow us to really try to provide to you a forecast of the future. So this presentation will introduce weather forecasting. Uh, we'll also introduce, when looking at weather maps, uh, we'll look at some of the symbology and the items used in order for uh, us to interpret data, current data at weather stations, uh, and to be able to understand what that means, which is actually quite interesting. You know, we're going to learn that there are very uh, distinct uh, symbologies uh, so it looks almost like a, like a music note and depending on the orientation and how many little you know flags it has and different numbers uh, this little image will tell us you know a tremendous amount of weather data uh, you know wind direction velocity uh, cloud type cloud coverage uh, temperature humidity I means dew point <laughs> it gives us so much information by collecting all of this data and for long periods of time allow us to better understand tomorrow's weather. So that being said, let's get started learning about weather forecasting. Well, to begin, let's discuss the acquisition of weather data and how we categorize it. So, weather forecasting is essentially the prediction of how the present state of the atmosphere will change by utilizing long-term and real-time data. So we're using what is observed today at our weather stations and utilizing and comparing it to long-term data sets, perhaps climate data, perhaps just regional data, to try to predict what tomorrow or the day after will be based on those patterns. Now, we can categorize that into really three families. We have watches, advisories, and warnings. So watches stand for a favorable condition for potential and or hazardous weather. So watches is kind of like, okay, we're watching out for it. Things are looking pretty good that it could happen, but we're just keeping an eye on it because it may not. Then we have an advisory. An advisory means that, you know, it's for semi-hazardous weather is highly possible. So things have been escalated. So it's no longer, we're just kind of keeping an eye out for it. Now it's like, okay, no, it could happen. And now we're really going to keep an eye out for it because things have much more been escalated uh, for, you know, weather conditions to be appropriate for some form of extreme weather. And then the last one is a warning. Uh, the warnings stand for hazardous weather is imminent, meaning that it, we are sitting on ready and it's going to occur. And, and, or it's already, you know, active. It's already been present in the current state of the atmosphere. So you've probably heard these terms before as a weather warning, uh, a weather advisory, or a weather watch. So when listening to the news, they say, oh, we're on weather watch spring 2021. Uh, we know that, okay, well, we're watching and seeing what's happening, but we're not really too concerned. I mean, the weather conditions seem appropriate for precipitation or some form of weather, but it's not really a big concern. Versus moving into a warning. We're in weather warning 2021 or 2022. You know, that means, okay, no, things have been ultimately escalated to the, to the peak and either the extreme weather is going to happen or is currently happening in certain areas around your location. So the next part is going to start looking at specifically weather forecasting tools. Now there are lots of different tools utilized for forecasting weather, but we're going to talk about just a few of them just because they're perhaps things that you've seen of or heard of before. So the first one is called AWIPS or the Advanced Weather interactive processing system. So this is a complex network of systems that ingest and integrate the meteorological, hydrological, satellite, and radar data. Essentially, it takes all of these data values, you know, such as Doppler, which is something we'll talk about on the next slide, and creates pattern maps. It's used by many organizations, such as the National Weather Service, the Storm Prediction Center, the National Hurricane Center, and many, many more. So what they're doing is they're taking a lot of different data sets, and they're utilizing that data to create an interactive, real-time, in-motion map. So this diagram, you perhaps have seen something before. You know, what's interesting about this is they're utilizing color as a gradient uh, to show the severity 
whether it be severity of temperature change, precipitation values, cloud coverage, things like that. We can also observe on this map that we can see uh, that we've got our pressure gradient lines. So not only are we able to utilize these systems and see, okay, well, we see a storm that's developing here, we can see the direction it's moving, that we can then utilize the pressure gradient maps, you know, looking at those isobars to see, okay, is this a high pressure, low pressure, which way is it going, how fast is it moving? And these tools allow us to better understand the prediction for later today, tomorrow, so on and so forth. Now, the one thing that we did mention uh, is Doppler. So Doppler weather radar is actually quite fascinating. I mean, we've had it for a long time, but it really picked up steam uh, in the last decade or so. So Doppler weather radar. So during World War II, military radar operators noticed noise return echoes due to the rain, snow, and sleet. So that ended, that ended up a, a partnership in, you know, with MIT to study weather data and to design specific Doppler radar systems utilized specifically for weather systems. As we can see in the bottom left-hand corner, there's your Doppler system. Uh, you know, and a very large cumulonimbus uh, storm system is developing there in the background. Well, I picked this diagram on the right. This is very interesting. This is from uh, the National Weather Service based out of San Diego. Uh, looking at these large echoes, we can see it's, it is a very um, you know, elevated central point. In fact, if I hit play, we can actually watch it move. And this became, and this, you know, this came up on the, uh, the Doppler system, uh, me, uh, climatologists, meteorologists were looking at this like, what is going on? Like, what is this very large, um, you know, mass that's coming out of Barstow area heading south southwest? And come to find out, uh, it was not a weather system. It wasn't. A, it wasn't a density of a cloud, uh, as we think. It was actually a massive, massive migration of ladybugs known as a balloon. And so this was a tremendous unfathomable amount of ladybugs that were migrating uh, across that area heading out uh, down into as you can see it's you know past Palm Springs heading into uh, Palos Verdes and stuff like that but anyway uh, I guess I remember this in 2019 because uh, I live out in Santa Clarita and I remember this coming through and it was like a big uh, ladybug uh, migration it was very interesting now another weather forecasting tool that we have is called a meteogram so meteograms are charts of one or more meteorological variable with respect to time uh, whether observed or forecasted so this this is a very a very simplistic uh, example of a meteogram that we can utilize so what we're looking at uh, is we can see that there's a temperature gradient. So this is you know what we're looking horizontally. Here's zero uh, up to 12. This is down in Celsius degrees. We also have, as we'll talk more about these in a moment, this is uh, wind velocity and direction. We have our uh, barometric pressure on the right hand side. We've got our dates. So what we're seeing is what's happening throughout this particular storm. We see that a bulk of, based on the color, precipitation is going to be happening on Tuesday um, at you know zero zero o'clock, moving into that time says so you know, midnight. Uh, then we can see that as the day progresses, uh, the not only is the as a red line the pressure increasing, we also see that the amount of precipitation begins to decrease uh, to the point that we no longer have any form of precipitation available. And so we kind of go through a cycle of snow to rain, snow snow, uh, you know, cloudy with with sun, and then pretty much nice clean uh, uh, atmospheric conditions. And so this is the way that we can look at that. As you can see, it's split over just a partial of two days. Another one that we can utilize is called sounding. So this is a vertical chart that includes temperature, dew point, and even wind. The most common form of a sounding tool that you probably are familiar with is a weather balloon. So what we do is we send that weather balloon up and, you know, depicting on uh, the rate that it moves. Uh, you know, it through the atmosphere and the direction it gets blown, you know, if it gets moved around, uh, you're able to really understand the weather conditions in the atmosphere at that certain location, going not just in one spot, but moving, you know, essentially horizontal all the way up. So what we can see in this diagram here uh, is it's broken up. These horizontal lines represent uh, pressure gradient, and then we can have temperature uh, going back and forth. This is, you know, utilizing some of that data. And these, again, it's additional tools that we can use. And this one here, uh, weather satellites, this is probably the most prominent that you're probably familiar with. So these satellites are used primarily to monitor weather and climate data on Earth. Uh, some are polar orbiting, meaning that they're covering the Earth asynchronously. So that's polar uh, orbiting, and then the other one is geostationary, meaning that it hovers over the same spot along the equator. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, 
These have also been used with forest fires, dust storms, snow coverage, ice mapping, volcanic ash clouds, and so much more. So we're able to utilize uh, this imagery for more than just looking at weather data, but we're able to look at real-time uh, photographs. Perhaps you've seen weather satellite imagery when we've had massive forest fires in California, and they're showing that image that image of the cloud coverage covering, you know, usually um, over the Pacific, you can see you know, burning in the cloud coverage, moving and covering, you know, hundreds if not thousands and thousands of square miles. Uh, so this is a photo of a traditional satellite. Uh, we'll talk more. This is a, a geostationary, but to kind of see what it looks like. So these are the two differences. We've got geostationary and then the, the polar orbit. I took this image from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, website. So it kind of explains the two different types of satellites. So we have a geostationary on the top, as you can see, it's utilizing imagery based off the equator. And then we have a polar orbit where the satellite is actually going around the Earth from pole to pole. So there's some uh, verbiage here, and I'll just go through it real quick just so you can hear it. Uh, so first, geostationary orbits. Geostationary satellites orbit the Earth's axis as fast as the Earth spins. They hover over a single point above the Earth at an altitude of about 36,000 kilometers. This orbit allows these satellites continuously to look at the same spot on the Earth, important for locating the position of hurricanes and monitoring developed severe storms. The second one is the polar orbit, and so the blurb there says, Polar satellites, also known as sun-synchronous satellites, orbit above the Earth at about 715 kilometers. Polar satellites monitor strong storms that move across the poles, regions of the Earth that geostationary satellites otherwise could not view. So we're utilizing all of these different satellite devices to pick up you know, a different you know, spectrum of imagery. The way that I think about this, not that I have a lot of experience in film, but uh, you know, when you know, when you're, if you're trying to film a movie or you're trying to film uh, a scene or a documentary, uh, you normally have cameras set up in different positions filming at the exact same time. So you're trying to get different angles, different views that otherwise would not be perceived in one direction. And so by doing, you know, utilizing both of these types of satellites, we're able to get a lot of different, a breadth of imagery, uh, different angles, different perspectives, and things that would otherwise not be in your plain view. Like as an example, you can see me here, but you don't know what's on these walls over here. But if there was another camera set at a different angle, uh, then you'd be able to see what you know. There's a window over here, or that I've got uh, some artwork on this wall over here. So that's why it's important to have those two uh, different types because they are measuring obviously the same information, but from different angles, perceptions, uh, and utilized for different resources. The next one uh, that I just wanted to kind of put together is. What does that look like putting it together? So this is really that weather forecasting tools together. So we're, you know, this is an actual image, um, you know, of the Earth. This is through both NASA and NOAA. This is another one here on the right-hand side, uh, showing that Doppler imagery as well. So it's picking up densities of cloud coverage or whatever these masses might be that it's picking up. So I guess a great way that we can utilize this data than what it looks like to us. Uh, this one here uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, based on what it's saying, it's saying negative 90 Celsius, so it's picking up uh, very, very cold uh, environments. So this must be a massive weather system, perhaps a low-pressure system that's moving through these areas at this time. I don't know when this was. It was in July 2018. That's kind of putting it together. Uh, the next part that we're going to look at in, in specific is looking at computer and weather forecasting. So actually moving into some of the forecasting tools uh, that are utilized. So we, we, well, I guess we covered the tools themselves, but now let's see them in action. So let's move forward with computer and weather forecasting. And we'll talk about also the different types of forecasting. Uh, it's no longer just utilizing the tools, but now saying, okay, now that we have this data, what can we do with it? So the first one's called an analysis. An analysis is the final chart produced by the NCEP, or the National Centers for Environmental Predictions. The chart will not only plot the data, but also be utilized to predict the weather, because we're going to be able to see the direction in which certain masses are moving, what type of pressure systems, and things like that. Another one is called a prognostic. Uh, that chart is for a specific forecast for a very specific period of time. And then we got to throw, since we're talking about computers, a fun fact. Did you know that one of the world's first computers was built for the specific purpose of performing weather forecasting? And now you know. <laughs> so then we can move forward into other weather forecasting. So there's actual names for these different types of forecasts. 
So I'm going to spend some time within this. The first one is called a persistence forecasting. So that is the use of the current state of the weather to predict the future. That means it must be short term. Persistence forecasting is very short term, right? Because it's like, well, I'm looking at the right now to try to depict what's going to happen in an hour, two hours, three hours. Then we have steady or trend forecasting, the assuming of constant change rate. So we're looking for trends. So we're like, now we're kind of trying to utilize uh, some of that persistence, right? Some of what we can see and comparing it to certain trends and trying to predict a little bit more into the future. We then have analog forecasting. So that's pattern recognition. Analog essentially just means that, oh, hey, I've seen these type of conditions before. So I've seen this before and this is what happened then, so I'm trying to create some form of assumption that based on prior experience, what I'm observing now, and then saying this is what's gonna happen in the future. Then we have the statistical method that is routinely used. It's a model output stats or MOS. So we're utilizing stats, which is everyone everyone knows math, right? So we're utilizing what is what are the, the probability of based on current conditions and data of what's gonna happen in the future. Which brings us also into then probability. The probability method is uh, it's, it's based is on historic data alone. And what is the chance of snow uh, in Las Vegas in July? So we're using this, the probability of based on this long-term data that we have in our minds. So think about that, you know, what are the chances of snow in Las Vegas in July? Is it possible? Anything's possible if the conditions are right, but we generally know that that's not gonna happen, right? And then the last one is the climatological, it's a hard word to say, lots of syllables, uh, forecast. That's used to predict the future based on information for the average weather conditions at a specific location during a specific season. So essentially, you can kind of think about it, that as we kind of work through this, you know, these lists of forecasting, that they utilize more and more data to be a little bit stronger in the... Um, the length of our forecast because we know that as you know a one you know, well traditionally it's a three five and seven day forecast you know the farther out you go in the forecast the more risk you have of being wrong uh, you know the closer you are to it because you're using the real time real data what's happening now to predict the future you're, you know you're more likely to be correct in a very shorter window so on this right hand side I found this chart and thought this was interesting um, and so these are just some of the terms that we use uh, as you know meteorologists so it says forecasting wording used by the National Weather Service to describe the percentage probability of measurable percent of precipitation for steady precipitation and for um, convective showery precipitation so what does this mean? So when you hear a weather person say that there's a slight chance of precipitation, that is actually a measurement. So that's not, that's not just a, a hunch. It, that there is an actual percentage associated. So a slight chance means you have a 20% chance. A chance of precipitation is between 30 and 50. Precipitation is likely is 60 to 70. And then when we say that precipitation is occurring, uh, it must be greater than or equal to 80%. And then we can use the words, you know, uh, widely scattered showers, scattered showers, numerous, and so on and so forth. So as an example, it says down here as in the little asterisk to kind of explain down here, a forecast that calls for an 80% chance of rain in the afternoon might read something like this. Okay, I'll... Cloudy today with rain this afternoon. <laughs> That's what that means. And then it says for an 80% chance of showers, it might read like this. Cloudy today with rain showers this afternoon. So it's just interesting that there's actual specific terminology used in those forecasts uh, to be appropriate. So now we know. Now we know when they say there's a chance of rain, uh, you have a 30 to 50 percent. Well, that's what that means. The more you know, the more you know, the better you can prepare for your vacations and visiting Disney World. So I've kind of mentioned this already. But when we talk about just you know looking into the type of forecast, that we find that there are certain rules within those ranges. So we can see that a very short range, which is up to six hours, you know, between now and later this afternoon, uh, we're going to be utilizing satellite and Doppler data. That's going to be very, very, very um, accurate, to say the least, because we're utilizing a very you know the data the present data for a very short window. Now a short range, is about two to three days, we're gonna be utilizing satellite Doppler data radar, winds and pressure maps and some other models. 
So we'll be utilizing that two to three, as we can see, two to three days, we're, you know, we're still within that 90% accuracy. Now, long range, we start losing that credibility. I've seen weather data up to 16 days. It's not very accurate. It's based on trends and global expectations. Um, I mean, when it comes to its accuracy, you, you know, as you can see in this diagram in the top right, you know, one, two, three, four, five days, 90%, six and seven, you're about 80%, and then anything beyond that, you're looking at 50 and less percent accuracy. So when you're trying to find out what the weather's going to be like in 16 days, so many different attributes could change. So many things could affect our global and local weather that it just, and we can certainly look at trends and come up with a prediction. But that doesn't, you know, it, it lessens your odds of it being accurate. Uh, we So when we use the word extended forecast, that's any forecast that exceeds three days. And an outlook is how the average weather conditions for a month or season compare to normal ones. So when we're looking at an outlook, so when you hear that the, you know, the weather guy or gal or person says, oh, we're looking at the outlook for um, mammoth. Well, we're looking at the current weather based on long term during that season you know maybe we're low we're high in snow uh, maybe it's warmer maybe it's cooler and so we're looking at just a comparison we're not really trying to predict a whole lot we're just trying to compare what we're experiencing right now compared to what we normally would experience so like oh well normally in mammoth during july this is what it's been like and then compared to what we're having now that's part of that outlook so these are different types of forecasts so, so far we've covered uh, really an introduction to some of the tools, some of the items that we utilize, and really how that gets computed. We really haven't spent a lot of time looking at the data. We are collecting weather data in so many different places, but how do we interpret that? Well, we utilize what's considered a station model. So we have weather stations throughout the world, <laughs> everywhere, um, and those those stations themselves can create a model or a diagram that that you know is included with symbology that entitles information for us to uh, you know to interpret and go oh well that's what this means so by looking at a very simple diagram uh, we're able to understand a tremendous amount of data so let's look at that so this is the station model lots of information on this slide I know let's just start on the right hand side. This is the station model. The blue arrows are depicting, or pointing at that, that part of the symbology or that image or that diagram and saying, well, what, that's what it means. Now, station models themselves, the stations, can be everywhere. So maybe you're at Victor Valley Community College, College of the Canyons, College of Alameda, maybe it's Santa Monica City College. So maybe you have an actual weather station at one of those locations. Well, that data that's gonna be given off into a computer will be observed in a diagram like this. A long time ago, before we even had you know the onset of these digital digital stations, you actually had people who were in charge of documenting these diagrams. And so you know, instead of writing out a huge report, you just drew out a couple of symbols that represented the average weather for that day or that time or that moment, uh, and then it gets stored as a diagram. And so we have a lot of those. I was able to look at some of those from the 1930s, like late 1930s, from the Van Nuys Airport. It's pretty cool. But as we can see. Some of the things that are observed in this diagram are wind and wind direction. So this is that, the flag, uh, the, the orientation of the flag and the amount of wings that it has or, uh, depict the uh, velocity and direction of which it's coming from. We have this number here represents the temperature, the dots represents the overall weather. Uh, the actually, the uh, number down here underneath the dots represents the dew point. Uh, the circle within you know, our music note uh, depicts the sky coverage. Then we have our pressure trends by looking at this angle. This angle represents the trend and then the uh, rise or drop of that on average. And then we can look at this number here which represents the sea level pressure. So on the left hand side that's where it gets more complicated. But with this chart we're able to interpret the diagram on the right. So we can see that the little, you know, the 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 circle of our music note, depending on what it looks like, uh, will tell us the type of cloud coverage. We can also see that depending on the uh, flag on the dot, uh, that will tell us the speeds. We can see then the types of weather conditions, whether it be rain, snow, drizzle, uh, whether it be intermediate, steady, or even thunderstorms. Look at all these little symbologies. I guess I love it. It's just it's a piece of art. And then we have cloud types in case you have very specific information you want to include that, oh, well, there's heavy cirrostratus clouds, we would include this image here. We also move down into additional showers uh, as part of these symbologies and then the barometric, barometric 
tendencies uh, allow us to understand what's happening. So as an example, assuming maybe this is at your college, we can look at the circle. It's open. It means that there's no cloud coverage. The three dots, the three dots imply that there has there has been steady rain. It's been moderate. We can see that also the dew point is 56 degrees Fahrenheit. I can look at the pressure trend based on the angle. Um, the it is falling steadily, uh, about negative uh, six. Uh, is that falling uh, attribute, the sea level pressure is at 107. Uh, looking at the wind, this is depicting the direction in which the wind is coming from. So we can see it's got the sticks, so it's you know, it's already got at least five knots, and it's gonna have two, so it's actually gonna be, it's a full and a half, so it's gonna be 10 plus five, so it's gonna be worth 15. So we're saying that we're having about 15 knots of wind, and it's coming out of the northwest. So it's coming from the north, I guess if I turn to the same angle that we're looking at here, it's coming from the northwest and traveling downward. So the wind is blowing in you know this direction, but it's it, these lines, when we speak of weather, it's always implying in which it's coming from. So it's originating from the northwest and it's traveling to the southeast. So we're able to really look at these attributes. I mean, not everything has been depicted on here uh, for this diagram, but it gives us a, a nice little um, snapshot of what's happening at that station. And imagine if we have this for all kinds of different stations, you know, different campuses, different buildings, different locations, different observatories. So we're able to put all this data together. And again, all of this here is traditional information that is used for studying the current weather, things that we can use to compare towards climate and what we're going to be using towards our predictions. So let's look at another station model. Um, this is another example of one, uh, a little bit different, but same idea. Um, so like this one here, you can see it's, you know, they're using a different code system to kind of, you know, instead of arrows, this is the one that came with this. This is super vintage, but uh, I liked it because it shows again, we've got, okay, this one's saying it's about half cloud coverage. We can see here, this has got 10, 20, and then five, 25 knots of wind coming out of the east, heading towards the west. Uh, we can also see that based on this diagram up here in particular, that they've got some cirrostratus clouds that are here. Uh, we can also see that there's also a developing cumulo, cu uh, sorry, developing cumulus cloud, uh, which means that we're experiencing, you know, we're on our way to perhaps uh, an active warning of extreme weather. Uh, this one's got three colons, which means that you have uh, moderate steady drizzle. Uh, which is pretty cool. So again, another way that we can interpret this information, which I think is really uh, interesting. So this is a sep you know, another same setup, I'll show you again, same as before. The only difference is just how it's been put together. This one has a little bit more information on it. This one here, look at this graph. So this one here means that the uh, pressure gradient is actually increasing in air pressure as rising and then it kind of steadies off. In fact, it's been rising at a rate of about 28 um, millibars. So then let's look at this one here. I have now three, uh, three different charts in which I want you to interpret. So I kind of included everything together. What you need to solve is the temperature, the wind direction, cloud coverage, pressure change, dew point, wind speed, pressure, and the current weather. So this first one here. So the what is the temperature for this graph? I'll give you a moment to look at it. The temperature is 67 degrees. What is the general wind direction? The wind direction, as we can see, is coming out of the southwest corner. That's the general wind direction. Now, what is the cloud coverage based on the circle here? The cloud coverage is about one quarter or 25%. What type of pressure change is being experienced? Is it going up or going down and by how much? So we're seeing that there's a change in negative 14, a drop, right? What is the dew point? The dew point is 24 degrees. And what is the wind speed? The wind speed, as you can see, it has the stick and one long, one solid uh, wing, wing or, or fin. So it has a value of 10 knots. What is the current pressure? 
the current pressure is 30, 138. And the last one is, so what is the current weather uh, based on that? So what is the current weather? So we can see that the current weather condition itself has not been documented, so that means there's not a whole lot happening. But we do note this graph down here, and we look over into the far left-hand side, we can see that we have very thin altostratus clouds. We know that altostratus are stratus, tall, uh, of which are not rain-bearing. So that explains that, okay, so we have about 25% uh, cloud coverage, very, very uh, high altitude clouds uh, that are just as you can see, very patchy, about 25%. So that's essentially how you're gonna do this. So I've got two more I'm gonna share with you. Be sure to plug in some of your answers in the comment box below. Don't forget to ask any questions. Um, but this will be about you know, the summary of what we're looking at. So um, let's move on to the next one. This one's a little more complicated, a couple different attributes on it I thought it was kind of fun. So again, just think for yourself, like what is the temperature, the wind direction? now? Remember, you have this chart as an amazing tool. You know, uh, in my courses, I've shared this chart in the uh, Canvas modules. If you don't have it, take a screenshot of it so you have it on your desktop. What a great way to solve an activity like this when you already have, um, you know, essentially the answer key because you're going to pull from here to put into there, which is pretty cool. You can see there's stratus clouds completely covered, so on and so forth. And then the last one here, I'll share. Again, another more, you know, a little more complicated, some different values, it looks a little different. You know, it, it's the same stuff, right? Same data, but just depending on who's drawing it, what computer system is using it, if it's done by hand, so on and so forth, may kind of change a little bit of the design, but it's essentially everything's in the same spot, same order, uh, same attributes. So, what do we cover? We covered in, in reverse order uh, the station models and forecasting. So, how do we interpret these station models and what does that data mean and what does it represent? Uh, then we started looking at the different types of forecasting and models. Uh, we also looked at the data sets that are utilized for that and so on and so forth. So, we really wrapped up forecasting as in what data is needed, what is that data, what do we do with that data, how can we view that data and then now we have it. And now we can look at the different types of predictions that are available. Some that are very uh, short term, some that are very long term, some that are more accurate, some that are not as accurate. Remember, the longer out we go on a forecast, the more, you know, the least accurate that data will be. I hope this was helpful. Be sure to put some of these answers below uh, to see where, you know, where you are with this. And if you need help, uh, don't forget to like this video if you have not already. Be sure to subscribe and we'll talk soon.